Well, now I'm happy to announce our next speaker. He is from Austria. He been, uh, his PhD in Germany. And now is an associate professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. He is working on different questions on financial mathematics, and he's just back from his sabbatical in Hong Kong and New York. Welcome, Stefan Storm. Okay, so uh, thank you, Mauricio, for introducing me. And thank you, Mauricio and Carlos, for introducing this really great workshop. What I want today is giving a talk which is a little bit um, 10,000 meter above the ground overview over some recent work I have done with different co-workers, uh, Mauricio Enrique Elizalde Mejia, who is presenting us here, Carol Bernard from um, Grenoble Business School and Peter Carr from NYU. And this is about three different projects I'm working with them but which have some common cores. It's a focus on the idea of a distribution builder. And they show all three very different, but very interesting mathematical aspects. And I think giving an overview about this is, is a good thing to start with. So what is the goal? Um, so uh, if you look on a very broad horizon, classical portfolio optimization was always done in two different spirits. So there's one school which basically says, well, we just want to invest in a way that is optimal on the long run, doing better than any other strategies. This is something uh, what is often known as Kelly strategies or Kelly betting was a Kelly criterion and is something what is pretty popular. And on the other end, there are people uh, starting with Martin and Samuelson who were criticizing this and saying, well, each investment strategy should take into account the preference structure in particular the risk aversion of the agents which are invested. And classically, this is taken into account, as Yanis has already mentioned, uh, by utility function. This is a very old concept, 280 years old, introduced by Daniel Bernoulli, was later axiomatized by von Neumann and Morgenstern, and there is, well, I would say for sure, a couple of thousands, no, it's not ten thousands on economics, finance, mathematical finance papers, uh, utilizing this. Nevertheless, uh, I'm, there has been over the last years come quite a lot of criticism on this paradigm using utility functions for uh, a spaces portfolio optimization. And criticism came from two different directions. The first criticism came from a school which is usually known as behavioral finance by people as Kahneman and Tversky, Quiggin, also uh, Richard Parler, who also Kahneman wrote won Nobel Prizes for the work. And their line of criticism is basically saying these utility functions, which with Bernoulli speaking, always assumed this uh, increasing and concave functions of wealth are actually not what actual people believe in if you test experimentally what they are doing. Well, increasing this is not so, so, so much an issue. I think most people will easily agree that more money is better than less. But the concavity, which is basically a way to uh, encode risk aversion in utility functions, is something what is empirically very much not observed, in particular if we don't speak about gains but of losses. Of course, one can come up then with more general utility functions, which are not, I have to say, concave, not convex. Uh, 
and take other things into account, uh, which are practically given, for instance, that people overestimate rare and extreme events, but this comes in a very high mathematical price. You can no longer work with probability measures and expectations, but have to distort them, have to work with things like Chouquet integrals, and it gets pretty tricky. I personally think this is a very good criticism from a point of view, if you want, that uh, utility functions actually describe people's behavior. However, I can easily say that if I want to give you investment advice, I don't care as much about how people behave empirically, but I want to give them the best advice on the basis of what I believe is theoretically correct. So if I don't assume that utility functions are something descriptive, but if I use them as a normative prescriptive concept and say this is what people should do if they behave rationally, then this line of criticism has um, not so much credit. However, there is a second line of criticism, which I think is for what we want to do a much more serious point of view. And this is the utility function, or even risk aversion, coefficients of risk aversion are something that is very hard to measure for practical purposes. There are many people who are trying to estimate them empirically, but this estimation is uh, rarely uh, really consistent. If you look on different methodologies, people come up with widely uh, different coefficients for the same people and so on. So it's, it's really something that is very hard to estimate and to get consistent estimates. So uh, this is why I think it's very complicated or actually not really feasible to build up practical investment strategies on utility function or even on risk aversion. Now I can say and take a bold stand, uh, 280 years of utility functions are enough, but uh, I have somehow to explain you what we can do else. I cannot just throw out everything out of the window. Thankfully, I don't have to do this myself, but other people who are much smarter than me uh, have done this already. And I'm thinking a particular about Bell Sharp, which I think is in this community very well known, uh, not least for his invention of the Sharp Ratio, being one of the founding fathers of the CAPM and passive investing and winning also a Nobel Prize. And he, together with his co-authors, in particular Dan Goldstein, who is a uh, leading psychologist came up with a different technique on how to guide investment of people. And this is something what is called the distribution builder. What is the intuition behind it? Well, they say basically, indeed, investors are notoriously bad in estimating correct with a utility function or risk aversion. And instead, we should try something different. We should try to get more direct information of the agent, of the investor, to conclude from there about uh, how to do the investment. And specifically, so look on a um, very specific problem and saying we are looking on a finite terminal time portfolio optimization, meaning you think about the time horizon as your retirement and want to optimally invest from now up to your retirement and say, let the people choose directly the distribution of the terminal wealth among all potential distributions which are possible given the specific initial capital, the current wealth that somebody has. This is something which has been developed in particular in this very nice book by Bill Sharp, uh, Investors and Markets, 
I read it only quite recently, a year ago or so, and I found it really revealing. And uh, I think he explains everything so clear that I'm actually a uh, copy a page of his book. He says, what is actually classical utility-based portfolio optimization? Well, you have usually three inputs. You have a budget. How much money do you have? You have the prices, the state prices, the prices of the different assets in which you can invest, and the evolution, assume you have a Black Scholes market, any other kind of market which describes prices. And you have preferences, usually given in form of a utility function or in form of a risk aversion coefficient. And then the goal of the optimal investment problem is finding an optimal strategy for investment that at the end you come up with an optimal terminal distribution for your wealth at the time of your retirement payment. And he says, well, let's try to turn this whole thing on your back. Can we not work with having the distribution of the optimal wealth as an output of this problem, but can we turn everything around to have it as an input? So what we want, we want still to consider that an investor has a given initial budget. We want also that the market prices of the assets are exteriorly given, but now we want to take the distributions already as an input. So letting directly specify the investors a desired distribution. And we can find from this an optimal investment strategies. And basically as a side product out of this comes a description of the optimal preferences of the investor. So we turn the whole process on how we approach a mathematical modeling of the investing on its head. Now, of course, a critical point here is treating a distribution as an input. How can this practically be done? And this is exactly where also psychology and the psychological input comes in. And uh, Sharp Goldstein and the co-authors came up with this tool, what they call a distribution. To say, okay, let's have this thing, which looks a little bit like Tetris. And we have basically here 100 small bricks. And each of these bricks uh, is basically one percentage of your optimal wealth, what you want to have at future time. And the investor can move these bricks around. And what is going on behind this is an engine which calculates how much money this specific distribution needs. And you have here on the left side this cost meter. And of course, you want to move the things around somehow that you use all your budget. Of course, you cannot use more. If I would just move all the bricks to the upper end, this would be much more expensive than I can afford, so this is not allowed. On the other hand side, I don't want to use only part of my budget, I want to move all, so I'm trying to move these bricks around so that this overall distribution, you see basically here the probability density function seen when I rotate everything by 90 degrees and I want to find the distribution which I really like and which I can afford. And this is something what psychologists have shown is something where people are really skilled at having these 100 movable pieces, each one representing, I don't know, $100 or $1,000 of your investment and coming up with these 100 scenarios in which you are uh, investing. This is people feel very comfortable in investing. Well, we maybe as mistrained mathematicians or economists, we have a relatively good thinking about risk aversion. People who are not this usually don't have it in such a model is much more helpful and easy. Now, of 
course, this is a nice graphical interface, what is happening in the background. So the critical question is, of course, how this calculation in the background, if I come up from a distribution, how is the cost of this distribution calculated? Basically, what is the pricing engine which is running in the back of this? And if you try to think about this, the critical thing is we speak here about something as what we are usually not so much used about it. Usually, we are very much used to think in terms of random variables and trying, let's say, an option pricing to hedge a specific random variable. However, here we have not a random variable, we have a distribution. And we know, of course, that a distribution can have many different random variables which have exactly the same distribution. So what we have to come up is, of course, a hedging strategy, but this hedging strategy goes not after one random variable, but after one distribution. So we have to come up with an idea how we can find the cheapest way, the cheapest random variable which uh, describes this distribution. So let's turn a little bit more mathematical. What is going on here? Uh, this is an idea which is called the cost efficiency principle and which dates back in the economic literatures to the late 80s and the work of Phil Divick and there's uh, more math finance related work by her and show, uh, Bernard Boyle and Van Diffel and uh, the co -authors. So uh, what is the idea? The idea is, we have a complete market to make things simple. And in this complete market, we have to aim for a distribution. of. This is basically what the client, the investor gives you on the distribution builder. Well, we have written it more so like a PDF. Of course, we can calculate the CDF, which is describing the distribution. And hence, what we try to find is, we want to find the random variable X, which has the distribution F, and which is the cheapest among these random variables. Well, what are costs? Costs in an economic term means just we are calculating the expectation of this random variable under the risk neutral measure, or speaking a little bit more uh, economically, the expectation of the random variable multiplied with what is called the state price density or the pricing problem, mathematically speaking, a rather nicotine derivative. This psi is nothing else than dq over dp. And since we are in a complete market, this is only one q. So think about it if you're more mathematician, dq over dp. And what we want to do is we want now to look on all random variables x, which have this distribution function f. And we want to find the x which is the smallest random variable. And so the random variable which minimizes these costs. And after I found this, things are easy. Then I have the cheapest random variable. And all what I have to do is I have to find the hedging strategy for this random variable. But since we're in a complete market, every contingent claim is hedgeable. So there exists a hedgeable strategy. And I usually can, let's say, with up like Scholl's market, I can use a clock or cone representation theorem or something like this to explicitly derive this trading strategy. But how do we find this minimum? Now uh, we can use something about the theory of distribution, which are the Frege Höfting bounds for coppolas, or if you come more from an uh, Number theory side, this is nothing else than the hard a little what inequality said if we try to find the minimal random variable of uh, this product, this is nothing else than choosing the random variable x star, which is anti commonotonic to xi. What does this mean? Always when psi is large, x should be small, and other way around, if psi is small, x should be large. So it should have the opposite form of monotonicity. This Frege-Hörfting bounds tell you always 
you are as large as possible if the two random variables are co-monotonic, meaning are directed in the same direction, and you are minimal if they are anti-co-monotonic, directed in the opposite direction. Now we want the minimum, this means we have to go for anti-co-monotonicity, and anti-co-monotonicity we can write under very mild conditions in a very easy form and this way. Well, what is here behind this? Well, if I want to generate a random variable with distribution f, what I can do is I can just take a uniform random variable and then I apply the generalized inverse of the CDF, often called the quantile function of, to it, and I get exactly a random variable which has the distribution which I want. And since an inverse CDF is monotonally increasing, this object which has exactly the same monotonicity properties as the uniform random variable which you put in. So what I have to come up to put into this quantile function is a uniform random variable which is anti-comonotonic to Xi. How can I do this? Well, the easiest way how I produce a uniform random variable at least if my CDF of the price and kernel is continuous, is just applying the CDF to the random variable itself. Now, this is probability theory 101. If you apply a CDF to a random variable itself, you get just a uniform distribution. Unfortunately, this uniform distribution, since Fxi is increasing, is co-monotonic. To the price and kernel. Well, now I have an easy trick. If I have a standard uniform, well, also one minus a standard uniform is a standard uniform. And it has exactly the advantage that we are flipping the order around so it will be anti monotonic to the price and kernel. So we have here this nice representation of this optimal random variable for the minimization problem. And we are coming from this distribution builder. We can abstractly calculate this optimal random variable psi star. And from there on, we go to hedging. This is how it works in complete markets. And we can also connect this to classical theory. This is something what was done by Banachen and von Duffel and say, in this setting, we can actually equate this setting to a classical utility setting, meaning there exists a utility function such that this x star, which is optimal for our distribution builder, is also the optimal portfolio for a classical expected utility problem, meaning we are doing something very differently than utility maximization. However, what we are claiming is we can find some rational utility maximizing agent that if they invest according to the preferences, they will end up exactly with the same strategy as we are doing with our distribution level strategy. And this is something from combining the result which I have you just shown about cost efficiency, which gives you the optimal portfolio, and comparing it with the formulation of the optimal portfolio, which gives you classical duality theory. And uh, in, then you, you can just equate these two and solve for the utility function u, and you can get an explicit uh, representation of this. This is basically how far the subject, I think, has explored so far mainly. And uh, I think it's an extremely important and good idea. However, so far everything is limited by two factors. The one factor is we are looking only on terminal wealth. We don't look on something like intertemporal consumption. And the second thing what holds us a little bit back is that while we don't have to stick to Black Shoals, 
we are using the assumption of a complete market model in the background. So the question is, if we think that markets are in reality incomplete, and I strongly hold this belief, can we somehow generalize the strategy to incomplete markets? And let me look on uh, these two factors quickly. Let's start with what we can do on incomplete, uh, what we can do for intertemporal consumption. This is something what I'm working together with Mauritium. Uh, now, what we try to think about it is, okay, we have not only one date at retirement, but we want basically withdraw from our account every month, let's say, money. And we want to have a consumption stream, C1, C2, up to Cn, which tells me how much I want to take out after one, after two, and after n months of time. And of course, we want to apply this distribution builder approach. So we use exactly this approach here to let the investor decide on C1, on C2, and so on, on Cn, by keeping the budget constraint in place. Is this something what is feasible? Yes, this is feasible, and it's actually pretty easy to do it. You do exactly the same thing as you do at, uh, in the approach with the uh, terminal portfolio. The only thing is you just multiply applied a couple of times. Sounds easy. Well, the tricky thing is what you are doing is if you think about it from a point of distribution is, you are saying you're looking on a multi-dimensional distribution, but you're specifying only the marginals and not the copula, not the dependent structure between the marginals. What does this mean is if you're doing this approach, you will likely end up in a setting which looks like this. You will have strongly serial correlation between what you are getting. This is something like either you, well, let's say it's basically like you're rolling a dice and as a, a one comes up and then you get, well, a couple of dollars in one month, a couple more dollars in the next month, a couple of less dollars in the next month. And however, if you roll a six, you get a ton of money in the first month, uh, still a ton of money in the second month and even more money in the third month. So you have a very strong serial correlation of what is going on and either you get each month a lot or you get only each month a little bit. This is something which comes from the strategy but which is something what you actually don't want to right? actually I personally would not like to want. If you're telling me I have to go one month with only a small amount of money, well then I would hope that I'm compensated for this with a much higher amount of money in the next month. So what I would actually would like to have is that we don't have a serial positive correlation but a serial negative correlation. This is something what for me as an investor would be much more sensible than this sort. What can we do? What we can do is exactly not letting the dependent structure loose and treating it as a part of the solution, but actually prescribing the dependent structure after different months in time. And the way to do is doing it with couplers. So what we would like to do is to have not a choice of marginal distributions, but a joint of joint distribution. And then you can still use uh, theories using distributional transform to show that this problem is mathematically um, solvable. Uh, goes at least fine in discrete time, in continuous time, uh, we don't know. 
Of course, however, the critical thing is how you can formulate it practically. Choosing one one-dimensional distribution is easy. We use this distribution model. Doing it n times, well, we can just iterate it. But if we have to choose somehow from a multi-dimensional distribution function, this is something that is very, very difficult to do it practically. So what can we come up? Well, what we have to do is we have to disentangle the choice of the marginal distributions and the choice of the dependent structure. And uh, you choose to make things easy. You can just choose always one marginal distribution, which will be the same for each month. And then you have to choose a dependent structure. One way would be to use something like a Gaussian coupler. Something what actually makes even more sense, I believe, is to use Archimedean couplers like the Clayton coupler. Uh, I don't want to go all uh, the theory of Clayton couplers. I want to show you just a picture for the uh, bi-dimensional, the two-dimensional case, how this looks like. The so Clayton coupler has just one parameter alpha, which is going from minus one to plus infinity. And if it is very close to minus one, means the two dimensions are strongly anticorrelated, meaning if the x-axis is very high, the y-axis is very low, and if the y-axis is very small, the y-axis is very high. And if I increase this parameter, I'm slowly getting to something which is getting more independent and more independent. And here between a minus 0.01 and 0.1, everything looks very independent like a two-dimensional sample. And if I increase this factor alpha, I'm getting more and more a positive correlation. And if I have alpha is equal to 100, as you see already, so now all my sample points basically lying on one line, meaning I have a positive correlation. So this is a very easy way to enshrine a whole dependent structure just in one parameter. So to implement the system, practically all what we need is we have to find one distribution using the distribution builder doing it for each month, and then letting the client, letting the investor choose one dependent structure using the Clayton coupler approach. And from there on, we can drive these things pretty practically that to uh, implement this, what we have to do is we have just to generate using Monte Carlo methods, a distribution sample from the desired distribution, calculate for each of them the sum of all the consumption parts, and then looking on all the sums of the consumption parts for each sample, and looking on a sample of the pricing kernel, and order these two just anti-monotonically, and then basically just multiplying them, adding them up, it's just an inner product, which gives us exactly the cost to do. So this is a practical approach, how we can incorporate uh, consumption in a way which makes sense. Let me tell you as a small caveat, I don't have a slide for this, but from our calculation, it is just if you have want to have something what is very, strongly anti-correlated, this is something that is getting pretty expensive. So the optimal solution usually has a structure similar to this. And of course, if you're going here, it's getting a little bit more expensive. But if you are going more into this direction, you can buy this what you want, this anti-correlation between the subsequent samples, but the price you have to pay, it's just getting more expensive to get this uh, more anti-correlated strategy. Or put it differently, if you have a fixed budget, well, if you want to have a higher anti-correlation, you have to buy it of a price of either smaller expected returns or higher variance of average. Okay, this is the first part. 
Second part, what we can do is we can lock on income in markets, and this is a very different flavor. If we lock on incomplete markets, the first thing what we have to do is we have to establish a similar cost efficiency principle for incomplete markets. Well, what is going on? In an incomplete market, the issue is we have not only one pricing kernel, one rather nicotine derivative, but we have a full family and uncountable family. So the problem is we have not one Xi, but we have really many of them. Now, what we can do? Well, coming from finance, usually any idea is something like to do super hedging. And so the naive guess would be maybe doing something like, well, I want to take still the infimum of all random variables which have this distribution which I want to generate. However, since there is not only one Xi, I have just to take the supremum over all Xi, where these Xi's are all potential pricing points. And hence the cost of hedging a random variable would be just the cost of super hedging these random variables. This would be something like a naive guess. Unfortunately, we can show that this naive guess is wrong. It doesn't make any sense. It's actually something which is much too expensive. Let me explain a little bit what is going on. Well, if we look somehow on super hedging, then we can always have the question, take the first same from outside and the supreme from inside, or do we take the supreme from inside or the infimum from inside? Or are these two problems actually the same? Meaning, do we have a kind of minimax principles that we can interchange in And this is usually it's a nice situation which we are used mathematically. This is always the case. Unfortunately, this is here not the case. And it turns out, first of all, we can give signs where if we take the supreme of outside, we can show that this is the correct formulation mathematically, and we can choose if we have this formulation, and of course there exists some random variable with finite super hedging costs, then I can have a unique solution of optimal pricing kernel and optimal wealth, and I can represent the optimal wealth again as a functional of the optimal. Now, this is something where you can prove mathematically. It's a little bit technical. You have to use things like Komlosch lemma and work on the space of L0 of random variables. Topologically, very unnice, but it's doable. The problem is this formulation here, which I came up, I haven't found any reasonable economic explanation. So I can prove you something which is mathematically nice, but economically rather intricate. So, can we do something? The other way around, in outside soup inside is economically meaningful, but uh, doesn't make any mathematical sense. So uh, to get something out of this, what you have to do is you have to ponder a little bit more about the question, does a minimax principle hold and why doesn't it hold? And you think about it, usually you want some kind of low upper semi-continuity on your functional, uh, this is given everything is linear here. You want uh, it's, it's a compact, well, you cannot get compactness. So you have something like convex compactness, which is a usually reasonable proxy. You get this. Where everything turns out is you need usually convexity over the set which you're optimizing. And while the set of all pricing kernels is very nicely convex, if you think a little bit about the set of all random variables which have a specific distribution is of course not convex. Just take two random, uh, two Bernoulli random variables, take uh, linear combinations of them, you even don't get a Bernoulli random variable. So you don't have any convexity in space. So what one can do is one can look on a convexification of this set and convexify it and close it in the space of uh, L0, so um, 
convergence with respect to um, convergence in measure. And then we can use a theorem given by uh, Shitkovich and generalized by Bank and Kalpela. And in this case, we have a minimax principle. And we can show what we have shown is the useful for a correct formulation, soup and inf, is nothing else than if I enlarge the infimum to the convex hull, and then I can interchange infimum and supremum. However, in general, this is not the same as if I have only the random variables which have the distribution and not the concave hull, as a convex hull. So now we have to make sense out of this formulation, since this is equivalent to what we have. Now, Help comes from a nice result by He Tang and Zhang, which was published in an actual paper, said under some slight conditions as integrability, you can describe these convex closures as uh, in terms of convex order. And convex order means just that the expectation of a convex function is always smaller than the expectation of a convex function of the other vendor. This is convex order of random variables. And if our probability space is atomless and as the distribution is integral, then the convex closure can be written as a set of all random variables which are smaller in convex order, which leads us to this nice result that we can get an information that a formulation that we are having indeed a minimization over a super hedging problem. So we have this economically useful concept on we are doing some super hedging. However, we are taking not the infimum over all random variables which have exactly the distribution f, but over all random variables which are small or equal in convex order to f. If it would be equal in convex order, this is the same as equal in distribution. So you can think about this is a necessary relaxation of the problem. This is a correct relaxation to recover the correct result. And now we came up with an economically meaningful formulation which explains our mathematical result in incomplete markets. Okay. This is our second result on this topic, distribution builder. Our third result is some very recent work uh, jointly with Peter Carr. And uh, we are trying to utilize now the distribution builder for something slightly different. We don't want to build up a portfolio, but we want to do exactly the opposite. We have an asset and we want to find the best time to sell this asset. And you just think about this asset as something which is indivisible. So don't think about shares, which you can sell over time. Think about you have a house and you want to sell it. And the question is, which time is the best time to sell the asset? And we assume we know the dynamics of this asset. And the question is, can we find a stopping time? Can we find an optimal time when we want to sell this asset? This is also a classical problem, which similar to the portfolio optimization problem has been treated in the past in a universal and in a subjective way. Universal people, in particular, Shiryayev, Xu, and Sho, and Dutrois and Peshkir try to say, okay, what we want actually to do is, we want to sell at the maximum value of this. Now you all know that the maximum value is not a stopping time. Since I don't know at the time of the maximum, I will be of the maximum since I don't know what is going on in the future. So the idea is to find a stopping time which minimizes expected relative error of being close to the maximum. So I try to be as close as possible, but allowing myself only to stop it on stopping times and not in general. The counter side, the subjective side, is now using again whisker version, is using again 
utility functions and and then has to go to use um, uh, supreme of all stopping times of the expected utility of this, as done by many people, for instance, Lang and Wang in this setting, Peterson and Peshkir for mean variance, Vicky Henderson in a prospect theoretic setting. Again, our goal is to do something subjective, taking preferences of the seller into account, but not doing utilities and utility functions a hard to estimate. So we want to base this again on our distribution data. So the idea is to say we want to target a distribution F. So the investor tries to specify still a distribution, but this is now not the distribution for the wealth and retirement, but it's a distribution of the asset at the time of a sale. And we want to find a stopping time that the asset has really this distribution at the time. So what we want to think about is we want to say that a distribution F is attainable if we can find I almost surely find it stopping time that says that at this time has the distribution of. And of course, we should only choose among attainable distributions since unattainable distributions don't help. So we want to choose an attainable distribution. At the end, we have to be a little bit larger since we could have a distribution which is somehow better than an attainable distribution. And better, I mean, dominating in first stochastic dominance, first order stochastic dominance, and there we call such a distribution super attainable. And then the goal is to find and de characterize super attainable distributions, and of course trying to say something which super attainable distribution is optimal or which class of super attainable distribution is optimal, and where can we find a practical strategy which we can implement to do a sale in this way? Answer is we can all do this. And it turns out mathematically what we are dealing with is a score hot embedding problem. What is the score hot embedding problem? The classical power embedding problem tells you we have a Brownian motion and we have a distribution F and we want to look for a stopping time tall sets of Brownian motion at the stopping time tall is exactly this distribution F. Meaning I have a Brownian motion, I start it somehow, and at some point I stop. I have another pass, which is stop at another point. I have another pass, which is stop at another point. And I want, so it's a distribution out of all this stopped points give me exactly the distribution F, which I try to target. This is a very classical problem and has been generalized for general discrete diffusion. And in particular, the work of Azima and Yor is here important and for geometric bound in motion, Grunditz and Faulkner, Pedersen and Peschke, Cox and Hobson. And since we have not much time, let's just look on a simple case, which is geometric Brownian motion. For the asset price, we are discounting by some rate R. So the discounted asset price follows, again, a Brownian motion, geometric Brownian motion with a different drift. And we want to stop this process to have a distribution F or something better. Then we have this general theorem. If our excess return is larger than variance over two, any distribution F is super attainable. However, if the excess returns are not as high, a distribution is super attainable only if a certain moment condition is satisfied and this moment condition, the moment A, is given by the model parameters of the geometric. And now I have two subcases that if the excess return is positive, but not too high, then this allows me to find always distributions which have a mean 
higher than the initial X as asset price. So I can do indeed things by holding to the asset and selling it at a random time to increase the expected value. Whereas if the excess return is negative, then all what I can achieve is distributions which have an expected return smaller than the initial asset price. What is the consequences of this? Of course, this last case, this means I cannot get anything reasonable, I'm getting only risk in, so I should sell immediately. In the first case, well, I can attain everything by just holding on, so there is no need to sell. This means we have, we should just hold on to our asset and don't sell at all. And in the middle case, well, this is actually the interesting case, how we should pursue. Well, we can find out that we are optimal if this moment condition holds this equality. And these optimal distributions, we can describe explicitly as a stopping time as a first hitting time of a specific region giving by the asset price in this running minimum. This is basically a solution which is akin to the same as your solution to uh, the score or embedding problem. And we can apply this, and I'm going through this, get for let's say for log normal distribution an explicit solution. And how does this strategy look like? Well, look here. The blue one on the left is just our asset price, how it evolves. The red one is just the running minimum of the asset price. And the green one is just a function of our asset price, which is giving the barrier. And this says, well, the optimal time of the sale is exactly when the green line meets the red one. Or we can also symbolize it in a different way, not looking over time, but looking over asset price on the x-axis, running minimum on the y-axis, and the green line is my barrier. I have to sell when I hit the barrier. I'm running down and sometimes it's right. I'm running to the right, of course, if I'm going here on the left side up. And at some point I'm running so far up that I'm hitting the barrier, which tells me selling. And this is what is going on. So, I hope I have convinced you that this idea of using a distribution builder is on the one hand side what I think is economically a very reasonable concept and which on the other hand side, if you go beyond what has been established so far, leads actually to many interesting connections to very different parts of mathematical theory. And there's actually a lot, a lot to explore and I would invite you uh, to join this, to work on this topic, since I think this is something that is really interesting and there's a lot going on. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for your nice talk. And um, what I convinced that is uh, an ongoing and uh, different topic that uh, obviously uh, is very useful to, to measure or the preferences of users of investors. And let me uh, ask you and make a comment. First, uh, the comment about the dependence structure um, between the um, uh, consumptions. If one wants to consume in a way, a uh, positive correlated way, maybe this can be cheaper but doesn't compensate the fact that the, in the previous consumption should be um, greater and the next lower. And well, could, could be um, a trade off in, in that sense. Um, well, I, I, I don't know if you have a comment about this, but it's, it's a, a really interesting uh, how uh, this dependency structure can influence in the in the price of the of the efficient strategy, I would for for people who are knowing very well uh, classical portfolio theory. I think 
there people think very often in Markowitz terms that there is a trade-off between mean and variance. And I think we can hear in many situations for the dependent structure of consumption as well as for the asset selling problem, we cover very similar formulations that we have also a certain trade-off. This can be between mean and variance, but it can be also a trade-off between desired dependent structure and mean or desired dependent structure and variance. Basically, I get a more dependent structure which fits me better, but I have to pay a price that I get a less expected mean, or I have to pay a price that I get a higher expected variance. Or you can even think it as a three-way optimization that you have not only mean variance, but mean variance and a dependent structure parameter. And you want to find basically a combination of the three which is best fitted to your personal preferences. Exactly, thanks. Uh, and my question is very punctual about the mean of the lambda, lambda parameter of the duality formula you mentioned. Ah, okay. This is, yeah, this I skipped a little bit over on the technical details. Uh, just classical uh, duality theory. Um, where I was it? And this was much before, yeah. Classical duality theory tells you that you can always represent optimal wealth in terms of the inverse of the derivative of the utility function applied to some multiple of the pricing curve. Now, lambda is some constant which is not completely free to specify but which follows exactly from the budget constraint. What is your budget constraint? Under the risk neutral measure, you want that X star has exactly your budget, what you have. So you want that expectation of X star under the measure Q is exactly your budget. And this is of course a condition which uniquely defines this real value parameter mm. Yeah, I see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, uh, do we have uh, questions over here? Uh, Carlos, please. Uh, I, I think you have your microphone off. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> now I think it's... Yes. Uh, so, Stefan, uh, this talk of yours reminded me a, a conversation I had with some guys that run a trading company here. And, uh, of course, they didn't tell me the details because, well, they, they keep this in secret. But uh, they have, uh, they trade for customers. And uh, somehow uh, they, they are able to uh, get an idea of, of say the average uh, utility of their customers and what they told me that actually uh, customers are uh, quite risk averse they told me that uh, much more averse uh, than than uh, the logarithm would 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 model actually they they said something like uh, probably uh, an iterated logarithm would describe better the risk aversion of their customers rather than the rather than a logarithm so i don't know the, i mean to what extent this can match with with your theory so the so the so main idea to try to estimate basically preferences from consumers to infer strategies, I think is something what is relatively common. I think most people try just to infer some risk aversion parameters. I think this is most standard in the industry. However, I know Bill Sharp himself, he has actually a relatively large investment company in California, and he is, as far as I know, doing this distribution of that approach. Now, uh, for inferring risk aversion parameters, I think, there is 
quite a lot of literature on this and people try to estimate it very different techniques but I think they would all what I know I'm not expert on this and uh, I think Isabella might know more about this but uh, all what I know is yes I think all estimates for power functions are below the logarithm so all what I know are coefficients something as so the powers of between minus 1 and minus 20 which is a bit a large span but these are all negative powers so you have functions which are x to a negative power and logarithm is basically x to a power zero uh, if you rescale it practically so yes uh, this is this is in line with the literature what I know that people are more risk averse than the logarithm which is actually what is equivalent to the Kelly criterion uh, and, uh, and everything what is behind this. Yes, people are more risk averse than that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ioannis. Hi, Stefan. Very nice presentation. Thank you very much. And especially, I, I clarified various things uh, of the concepts you have developed. Uh, basically, the distribution uh, that we're looking at the end it, it could be uh, thought of as a transmuted distribution, right? Uh, because we go from, from now to T uh, to sometimes to X time, let's say. It is a transmuted distribution. No? What do you mean by transmuted? I'm not sure. I... Uh, I, I mean that that would be something uh, like a, a random function, function, uh, uh, function, function, in some sense. Basically, it maybe is like the product is a product of, pro of probabilities of getting uh, from one point to another point by shifting the whole distribution, no? or by moving the distribution all along. No, not really, since what we are doing. So the trick, the trick is to do it actually the other way around and speaking not about wealth or prices itself, but speaking about discounted prices. So uh, this is why in our um, Brownian motion example, we are using a discount rate R and what we are stopping is actually the process of discounted asset prices. Now we can discuss what is the rate R. Is this something like a risk plus rate? Do you want to make just some kind of overnight index swap rate? Or do you want to say, well, I'm not doing any hedging. I don't invest anywhere. All what I have is I have an asset. I hold to it until I sell it. So I can say, well, I personally might have a much higher discount rate how I want to sell in my future. So I specify a very high discount rate and uh, come from this to a model of discounted asset prices. And if you have discounted asset prices, then you have no more an issue of time preferences since the discounted asset price has in each time exactly uh, the same value for you. Uh, and then you can just choose an arbitrary distribution which you want. Of course, this distribution means it's not a distribution at one point, but it's basically aggregating over time empirically. However, since we are speaking in discounted terms, this is not a problem. If we would have not discounted terms and we would try to optimally stop this process, yes, then you would add in troubles that a dollar tomorrow is not the same as a dollar in five years. But since we are speaking everything in discounted terms, we can circumvent this problem. Yeah, I was thinking like, like that, that because uh, uh, I uh, wanted to, to use the house of approximation for that. That simplifies things in getting, getting to know the CDF. The CDF. Uh, that uh, 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 justifies, justifies uh, a very simple form. That's why I made the comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, uh, Stefan Storm, for your nice talk and all our attendees. If you want to ask more questions to our speakers, please stay with us. And thank you again, all panelists and attendees. I want to give the floor to Carlos Escudero to a final message. 
thank Mauricio. Well, uh, I would like to thank again Mauricio for his hard work during the organization of the workshop. Also, I would like to thank our four speakers for their very interesting talks. And also, I would like to thank all the attendees. Before concluding the workshop, uh, let me mention that we plan to run a second part of it sometime during the uh, the academic year 2020-2021. Actually, we plan to do it live here in Madrid, but of course this depends on the sanitary situation. And uh, if, if this is not possible, most probably we will run it again online. Uh, even if we do it live and some people cannot attend and we see that there is some interest in, in broadcasting this workshop uh, in the internet, then we can, we can do it. So if this is your case or if you have any comments or, or uh, any thoughts regarding this workshop or a, second, or, or a continuation of it, please feel free to write Mauricio and me and we will, uh, we will read your comments with pleasure. And I think that's it. Thank you all again, and I hope we will meet soon uh, again. So goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much.